prayers we have prayed this morning, the Bible we have studied, our observance of the Lord's Supper and showing forth His death till He come again and the emblems that comprise it, our contributing of our means cheerfully without grudging, purposing in our heart and trusting to grow even in this sacrificial gift, our daily Bible study, the songs that we sing, the prayers we daily offer, the help we offer to other people when they need it, the way we live as men and women and husbands and parents, all according to the Bible as we strive to put it into practice, are certainly very important, but they're worthless. Absolutely worthless if Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not the Son of God. I want you to think about that because while it's important that we study about doctrine, we're constantly determining from the Bible what's right and what's wrong in our daily activities. Christians are discerning people. We are to walk circumspectly. That means looking at all things all the way around the circle examining everything in the light of God's right and divided word, doing all we can to do things by the authority of Jesus Christ as set out in the New Testament, Colossians 3.17. The repenting that we've done, the turn away from things contrary to the way the Bible teaches it and turn back to the way the Bible said, all that's worthless, folks, if Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not the only begotten Son of God. So I'd like for us to realize this morning that all these things I've mentioned, while they're so very important, and I would not at all take away from their importance, they're important only because Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. Our faith is in Him. Remember Paul said, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If Christ has not done what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, actually the whole Bible, specifically the New Testament, but especially those four, if He has not done and undergone what He has done and undergone, we are of all men most miserable. We're wasting our time. We're spinning our wheels. There's nothing. If Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not the only begotten Son of God, so you should understand then that when we say, I know Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, in order to make that statement, I have to have proof. Remember 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, the inspired apostle Paul said to the church there and to all of us that we are to prove whatever it is we believe. That is... We should be able to prove that God exists, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is His Son, that the Bible is the Word of God, and from the Bible be able to prove what we believe in practice as to what is Christianity, even the definition of Christianity, what is the church, its work, its organization, its worship, its hope, and so on. But if Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not the Son of God, none of these things amount to anything. Because all we've said concerning our worship this morning, our daily conduct to bring our minds in subjection to the will of Christ as it is in the New Testament, doesn't amount to anything. So this morning for a little while, I would like for us to consider, though we've done it before, it seems good that we remember that without uh, our having proof that Christ is who the Bible claims to, Him to be or sets Him forth to be, then all of this discussion we do in Bible classes about the meaning of the Bible, the application of the Bible, the home, and all this, it's just no good. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want us to realize that Paul in this chapter, as we have it in our Bibles, is correcting false concepts and mistakes about the resurrection of, of Christ. Now look in verse 12 beginning. Now if Christ be preached that he rose the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, 
then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is also vain, and vain means worthless or empty or pointless. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we've testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Which means that everything about Christianity, everything about the Bible, everything we labor to know and to live, doesn't find its fruition and completeness here. It finds it outside this life. And that's why that Romans 8.24 says we're saved by hope. Our expectation of what the Bible tells us as faithful Christians, we have a right to expect with an earnest desire to possess the great inheritance. So if it's not true that Christ is who He claimed to be and thus did what He had to do to save you and me from our sins, then guess what? Our religion is a myth. It's fake. It's a falsehood. That's the reasoning of Paul. That's the significance of of Christ being the Son of God and doing what the Bible said He would do and did do to save us from our sins. So our faith must be in Him. And our faith to be accurate must be based upon the Word of God, rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2.15, Romans 10, and verse 16, or 17. So you see what he's saying. Our confidence, our trust, our belief, our faith stands or falls on whether or not the resurrection actually occurred. I've often said that if if you're going to prove anything about the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspired Word of God being the Bible, that if you prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was raised from the dead to die no more, by implication, you've proved the existence of God, the inspiration of the Scriptures. You've proved everything one needs to prove. And we ought to understand that. Now, there are objections to the resurrection. Some people say, well, it's unscientific. Now, I want to remind you what we've said most often and most all, if not all, know this here. Then we're speaking of dealing with things from modern-day definition of science. Then you're talking about dealing with things that your five senses can deal with today in the material physical world. That's exactly what you're talking about. The, and this is interesting. It's said to be unscientific, but this comes from the old Soviet encyclopedia. And here's what they have to say. The concept of the resurrection is, quote, found to be the most decisive contradiction with scientific natural knowledge which confesses the inescapability of death as the destruction of individuality with its physical and uh, cyclical peculiarities. You know what that says? When you're dead, you're gone. There's nothing else there is. You're like the little dog rover. You're dead all over. There's nothing to you. You're gone. You cease to exist. There is no more of you. And that's the atheist hope. But that's what they're saying, and that gets rather interesting. But what we need to know is that science, the true definition of science, cannot address the matter of the resurrection. Can't do it. One-time events are outside the scope of science. Let me say that again. And this comes from their own reasoning about what science is to do and how to study it. One-time events are outside the scope of science. One of the things about a scientific um, investigation must be repeatable. Must be. That's by their own definition of science because they're all engaged in the empirical, that is, the material and examining things through the five senses of sight and hearing and smell and taste and touch. And if you can't deal with something that way that is of the physical, it's outside the scope of, of science. It just is. It becomes a matter of history, events that took place in past time and space. Science can't examine that. Go try to study the... Battle of Gettysburg under a microscope. Well, you tell me how you do that. 
So I said, well, you got to look back in time. got to have a telescope. Well, try that too. <laughs> you won't be any better off. You know, either it took place or it didn't. Everything, time, past, past time and space, history, it took place or it didn't. A real historian is doing his best to get the facts of the past. Now, one of these charlatan historians likes to rewrite history. There's a whole host of folks out here that would like to say, I wish it had been this way. Well, who's here to stop me from writing down my wishes? And they do. Oh, no, people wouldn't be that way. Folks, is there any dishonesty in this world anywhere? Yes, there's a lot of it. People will outright lie, and some of the most uh, accomplished liars are highly educated people. Because it has nothing to do with education. It's what you do with what you've got to do with. And that determines how we think and our viewpoints and our morality and our character. Proof must be in the historical evidence. It just must be. Then some, uh, you turn and do as we're doing. We affirm the resurrection of Christ, as I just read it to you, from 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible affirms the resurrection of Christ. Now, I'm not going to read a lot of these scriptures. I'm going to proof text you. So if you want to write down the points and the proof text, fine. So please do that. Let's look first of all at Old Testament evidence for the existence of Christ, that he died on the cross, that he's resurrected. You will find this referred to in Genesis chapter 22 when it comes to Abraham offering Isaac by command of God. But then you'll find the whole story after you've read that and you go to Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, that great chapter on the faithful worthies. And remember to be faithful to do what God told you and the way he told you and for the reason he told you. Abraham, the scripture says, believed God. He believed God that he could raise up Isaac from the dead after Abraham obeyed God and took his life and offered him on the sacrificial altar. Actually, he could even raise him up from the ashes. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. Well, in that sense, the scripture says he received him back in a, in a figure. It was in a figurative sense. That is, in his mind, it was done. He's going to obey God. He knows this boy must be alive in order to fulfill the promises God made to Abraham. So he reasons it out that way. And we have to go all the way to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, to find out that's the way Abraham was thinking because it's not told us in Genesis 22. The figure, then, is a shadow of Christ's resurrection. That's Old Testament comments. Keep that in mind. Also, the book of Jonah. Why was it that Jonah was three days and three nights in the great fish's belly? Well, because he didn't obey God. Yes, but it's more than that. It's more than that. If you look in Jonah 1.17 and then compare it with Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 40, you'll see that that was pointing to the very time Christ would be in the tomb. It also is a good way to notice that Jesus Christ confirmed the account of Jonah, which means to say, oh, that couldn't happen. That's just some sort of myth. But Jesus said that it did actually happen and prefigured his time in the tomb. Well, if Jesus is the Son of God, what does that say about Jonah in the belly of the great fish for three days? Did Jesus lie about it? Do you know what he's talking about? You have also an interesting statement that you're familiar with probably more where it's quoted than, than where it originally appeared in the Bible, and that's in Psalm 16 and verse number 10. This is where David writes, Therefore, uh, or rather for, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Hades, the Hadean world, the place of departed spirits, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Well, that's, that's what Peter quoted in the very first recorded gospel sermon when he said this this is not referring to David personally. He was saying that's pointing to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that God wouldn't leave him there. So he's not talking about himself. And Peter makes that very distinct and clear in Acts 2, 29 through 31. He does the same thing again in chapter 13 and verse 33. Now we're talking about, of course, the matter of the Lord and the resurrection as it's stated in a predictive element of prophecy in the Old Testament. But now look in the life of Christ, his own predictions. 
in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, you have an early prediction of Christ being raised to the dead. Now, those who were his enemies said when he says, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. He was standing in the temple when he said it, and thus they thought he spoke of the temple where Solomon and then Herod, of course, built at this time. But he makes it clear that wasn't the case, that he was speaking of his own body, and he would raise it up. That tells you Christ knew exactly what was ahead of him all through his life. He not only knew about his death, he knew he would be raised up. But then in Luke 18, verses 31 through 34, the details are even given concerning, a little more detail, are given concerning the death of Christ by the Lord himself. But you'll see there that his own disciples did not understand the matter. It's very clear that they just didn't get it. It was hidden from them. Their knowledge wasn't to the point where they could put those things together. It would change, but at that time, as he talked about the resurrection, that he would be resurrected, they didn't understand it. And we can only say now, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there are numerous verses where the Lord alluded to his resurrection from the dead. Well, it comes down to this. Either Jesus spoke the truth or he's a false prophet. There's no other, there's no other conclusion to draw. Same thing of the prophecies in the Old Testament referring to the resurrection of Christ. That's either the truth or it's not. But coming on over into the New Testament, it's filled with not just statements, but very but statements of great confidence that Christ was raised from the dead to die no more. Listen to what is said to by Paul to the church in Ephesus, and thus to all of us, because it's part of the New Testament. And that same, the same is true concerning these other verses I'm about to read, following Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. Here Paul writes, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, now listen, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand, in the heavenly places. Now that's the same Paul that wrote correcting the Corinthians' mistakes, misunderstanding, and teaching on the resurrection. And he pointed out clearly there's nothing about us that's worth anything if Christ be not raised. We're still in our sins and all those who have died are lost. Again, showing the great emphasis placed upon the resurrection of Christ. And of course, when they emphasize the resurrection of Christ, by implications, it means he must have died when we're talking about resurrecting a dead man. We can't resurrect what's not dead, in this case, in this context. But that's not all. If you'll turn with me also to the Philippian letter, Paul said to the church in Philippi in chapter 3 and verse 10, this is Paul's own statement of himself and his efforts to be faithful and to grow in the knowledge and practice of the truth, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now, there's a lot in that. That's a text for a whole sermon. What Paul's saying there, even as Jesus suffered, and for the same reason he suffered, I want to suffer. That I can know full well the full blessing of salvation and glory in heaven. But he nevertheless points out that his faithfulness means that he will know the power of the resurrection. Well, there's no resurrection for us if Christ is not resurrected, none whatsoever, as Paul reasoned in 1 Corinthians 15, the passage we started with. But now turning over to the Colossian epistle, chapter 1, verse number 18, listen to again, Paul writes, speaking of the Christ, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Well, the firstborn from the dead, he wasn't the first person that was ever resurrected. Yes, he was when it comes to dying again. That's the reason I've said already several times, resurrected to die no more. Jesus even raised Lazarus from the dead, but he had to die again. But not so with Christ. He was resurrected from the dead, having no reason to be dead. That is sinless. Death couldn't hold him. That's the reasoning that's done in the Scriptures. And thus he triumphed over death, hell, and the grave to die no more. And we're taught 
That's for us too, and that's what Paul knew. So he labored to be faithful that he could know the power of his resurrection, as he said to the Philippians. But that's not all. Look over here in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Those in class this morning, the auditorium class, know we talked about Christ becoming flesh and what all that meant. Well, he took part of the same, even as we have it. Why did he do that? That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now look at verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We know if we're faithful, there's the resurrection from the dead for us. Now, if Christ be not raised, if He's not the Son of God, now, what do we have to look forward to? Why do we labor to study the Bible? Why do we labor to teach the truth? Why do we contend for the faith? Why do we go through this, that, and the other to keep our minds and lives in subjection to the will of Christ if Christ is not the Son of God? We'll look further at some evidence. Jesus did live in past time and space. Jesus did live in past time and space. He lived in first century Palestine. He was crucified. He was buried. Christian, Jewish, and even pagan history all agree on these points. Well, are there doubters today? Are there those that will say he didn't live as a human being in past time and space? Indeed, there are. But on what grounds? Adequate evidence and credible witnesses. They certainly can't deal with it through science. We've established that already. Well, I could, and I don't know why more people haven't done this kind of thing, but anybody can do this. Do you absolutely know through empirical means through your senses, sight, smell, hearing, taste, touch, that you had a great, great, great grandmother. And you have to say, no, I do not know that through my physical senses. Have you ever heard the voice of your great, great, great grandmother have you ever seen her with the naked eye have you ever smelled her and you remember her the peculiar perfume that she wore have you ever tasted her have you ever touched her and you're going to have to say concerning your great 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 grandmother Absolutely not. Then you don't know she existed. And your mind goes, ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, because it doesn't want to accept that. Because by implication, by the nature of what a human is, you had to have. You had to have a great, great, great grandmother. But if you're going to take the position that you can only know things by your five senses according to the flesh and what you can investigate right now physically, then you don't know. And then you say, well, there's high probability. Why? Not, there's no probability at all if you're going to approach it by the scientific way of doing things. Well, then, all right. Then how do you know that all this stuff that comes from past history, our history, how do you know that it's the truth? Then I'm going to ask you a question. Did Julius Caesar live on this earth and do the things history said that he did? And if you say, certainly. Now that word certain is a pretty potent word. Certainly. That means you're certain that he did. How do you know? You, you know if you don't know by empirical means that you had a great, great, great grandmother... Now, I don't know how many greats it would be, but you don't know at all whether Julius Caesar is 
what he has claimed to be as all this information has come down through history. And yet nobody questions his existence. They don't question his existence when it comes to uh, him or Alexander the Great. You know, there's a lot more evidence whereby we would prove Julius Caesar existed. There's a lot more evidence concerning Jesus existing in past time and space than there is that Julius Caesar existed. And on and on you can go. It's a very interesting study to get into all that material. So I say he lived in first century Palestine. I've got four books that nobody denies are books of antiquity. That is, they're the genuine thing written back there that says that he did and that he was crucified and that he was buried and that he rose the third day. And you've even got concerning his existence in history, as I said, various ones who were followers, but even Jewish and pagan history says he existed, said he lived as a man. If I were to say, I know, I'm certain, that George Washington, the one that's called the father of our country, the first president, I know, I know he lived and did what history says. Well, if you won't accept the kind of proof that comes down through history that goes beyond empirical means, as we said before several times already, you're not going to believe he existed. Let me bring it closer to home. How many people believe there was a president called Dwight David Eisenhower in the 50s? How many people say, well, I know he existed? How do you know that? Well, I've seen him on newsreel. You saw somebody on the newsreel that they told you was Dwight David Eisenhower. Everything that you would do to try to prove that there was a president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, in the 50s, all about his life, since he's been dead since 1969, everything you would offer to prove that, I can turn right around and say, how do you know? How do you know these films are real? How do you know that this is? I, you say, well, there he is. They've told you that that's who it is. And you can do that right on down the line. Now, I usually bring it down to like this. Jeff. You shouldn't be sitting down here that close, Jeff. I'm going to give him a rest. I've usually done this with both of them, but they, it doesn't work anymore. Right? Are you married to Carrie? I mean, you're down here on the front. She's way over in the back. Are you married to Carrie? How do we know that? Carrie, is he married to you? She said this. Well, they all get it straightened out between yourselves. I go to somebody else first. <laughs> the thing of it is, anything you would offer me, either one of you, to prove that you were married, how would we know it? So I said, well, we got kids. What does that prove? People all around us having kids right and left. They're not married. You see, if you don't want to accept adequate evidence of credible witnesses, you don't believe much of anything. And nowadays, with people you don't really associate with and know much about, you might say, well, they may not be married. Have to get an FBI investigation to go on to find that. And then you got to trust the FBI. So, you see, if, if, you, don't, if you don't do that, you, you have to walk around here and say, I really don't know about anything. Well, you just said you didn't know about anything. That's one thing you know, so... You just refused yourself, at least in that one area. And that means you can know something about something somewhere. And that is, you don't know anything about anything. That also makes the mind, it doesn't ping pong, it just falls apart when you start thinking that way. Well, what are the possible answers regarding the question, where's Jesus' dead body? Well, the disciples lost track of the tomb. Or his body was removed by his enemy. Or his body was moved by the friends. Uh, grave robbers got him. And then a biggie is that he just fainted on the, on the cross. And they took him down. They put him in. The coolness of the tomb woke him up. You know, Tommy a while back gave us a good Wednesday night sermon on what a person undergoes when they're crucified. Now, 
when they put Jesus in that tomb, um, first of all, those fellows that crucified folks every day for a living, so to speak, they knew when a fellow was dead. When he ran that spear up, <laughs> up under his ribs to the point to where out came blood and water, which means the uh, blood had already begun to, to the, the, the red blood cells had already begun to pull away uh, from the serum. You know, it's interesting that God would state that. That proves he was dead. It's like Marshall Keeble one time said at Lazarus, you know, the sister said, well, when the Lord said, remove the, the tomb, said, oh, Lord, he, he, he's, been, he's been dead. He, he, he stinks. It's decomposing. <laughs> Brother, uh, Brother Keeble said that, that means he was good and dead. Well, when he ran that thing up through there and out came this, that proved his death. That proved his death. Well, but how do we know? How do you know that you're even who you claim to be? Your parents may have drugged you out of a ditch somewhere and raised you such as you are. And they just told you that you are this. You know, you may not be. You don't know. If you start down that track and they love to do it in college to a lot of folks, you're going you're gonna to doubt just about everything. Jesus rose to the dead and he's now in heaven. That's what the Bible says. Now, which one of these are you going to believe? And on what basis are you going to believe it? And how are you going to prove what the Bible claims on the matter? Well, that's possible answers to what happened to Jesus' body. The tomb was lost, some people say. Well, it's interesting to me that if that's true, why didn't the authorities produce the tomb itself as evidence. They had said, and they did say, as Luke records in Acts 5 and verse 28, when they read, we would say, the right act to Peter and John, you're intended to bring this man's own blood down on our heads. They were denying that it was their fault. Well, they lied about everything else. What's wrong doing one more lie? The authorities could have easily destroyed the so-called gospel myth. They could have easily done it. The authorities knew where the tomb was. Matthew chapter 27, 62 through 66. They knew where it was. How do we know that? Well, they sealed the thing. They knew exactly where it was to send a guard to put a seal on it. They missed the tomb, put a seal on some empty tomb or somebody else's. And by the fact they put guards there to, to make sure nobody would mess with it. And do you think they had any records of this? Of course they had records of it. Then enemies stole the body. Well, why didn't these same enemies produce the body? That would have ended it. Imagine Peter standing up there and saying he's resurrected Christ, and they come dragging up this old body. <laughs> he did. That would have stopped it. They would have loved to have had that body on the day of Pentecost. Think about it for a minute. Jesus said, uh, rather, Peter said, concerning Christ, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. But then he goes on through and says, but God, God's raised him from the dead. And they say, yeah. We got that out of that tomb we had sealed. Here he is. You don't think they would have done that? Folks, look at everything else they did. They went so far as to hire people to lie. Of course, people don't do that nowadays. We said that the friend stole the body. You know where that started? In Mark 28, 13, it says the priest told the guards that you stake this, we'll go to bat for you. And it says they gave them much money. I don't know how much that is, but it must have been a lot. But the scripture also says they went to sleep. Well, that's useful, sleeping guards. You say, well, how do you know all of that? Read the Bible. Yeah, but that's the Bible. Well, so? Are you going to say it's not a book of antiquity? Are you going to go show me evidence it's not true? Then let's just start on Alexander the Great. Let's start on Julius Caesar. Let's start on any of those people in antiquity. And let's just see if you can prove they ever existed and did what history says they did. And we'll use the same argument you use against Jesus and see how you fare. Because you haven't got nearly the information I do that's, that's adequate evidence of credible witnesses as far as the historian and archaeologist is concerned that, as to what constitutes adequate evidence of credible witnesses. 
Matthew 28 and verse 15, it said that this business of the witnesses, uh, that all that stuff was spread around by the Jews. And it's frequently repeated in various documents throughout history. Well, why claim his disciples, why claim his disciples had stolen the body to make it look like a resurrection? Why? There's a problem here. The disciples didn't expect a resurrection. At the time of his resurrection, they were just completely bum-puzzled as to what it all meant. They didn't even understand what he meant when he says, I'm going up to Jerusalem and there I'm going to be condemned to the chief priest and die. What did Peter tell him? Not so, Lord. That was Peter's attitude. He's about as good as any of the apostles in trusting in Jesus. Mark 16, 11 through uh, 13, you'll see they didn't anticipate this. They didn't believe it. The 11 didn't even believe it. Luke 24, 9 through 11. And then in John 20, verse 25, Thomas didn't believe it and said, unless you give me the evidence, I'm not going to believe. And every one of those he accompanied with with Jesus for over three years and told him, we've seen him. I don't believe it. You know, they didn't gain anything from what they proclaimed about his resurrection. Uh, yes, they did. I'm sorry. They gained a life of persecution, of torture, and death. That's what they were rewarded for by saying that Jesus Christ of Nazareth rose from the dead and he's alive ruling in heaven. That's what they got. Men may die believing a hoax. Well, this Jim Jones, some of you remember Jamestown massacre thing. They, they believed the lie. But men do not willingly die knowing they created a hoax. They don't do it. Now, how did they get past these experienced guards who actually put on guard because they thought they might come steal them? They were looking for this kind of action. Well, the grave robbers. Well, there's no... no. Why did they want his body? No mon monetary motive to getting his body. They had it been paid to make sure his body was kept there as far as the Jews are concerned. That's the reason the guards were there in the first place. The reason they had it sealed. And by the way, if the grave robbers came, you still got the problem with the guards. Then the idea that Jesus swooned, or as it used to be called, the swoon theory, fainted on the cross. Well, he was six hours on the cross. And then you consider, as I said earlier, the spear in his side. Uh, that's pretty good damage, folks. That would say he's dead, and if he wasn't, we're making... Remember, he's thrust that thing in his side to make sure he was dead. And those folks, do you mean to tell me those fellas didn't know how to kill somebody and didn't know when he was dead? Death verified by executioners, and, and I think that's obvious from the totality of the information we have, and Pilate, before the burial was even allowed. Remember, they came to him saying, I want to take his body, put it in my tomb. What does that imply? He's dead. And removing the stone after those significant wounds, I didn't mention this earlier, if he just swooned, it wouldn't have been too easy. Remember that time he was on there and nailed to the cross and all he underwent the night before? He was already so weak before he got the crucifixion. What happened? He fell beneath the load of his own cross and had to compel another to um, take it. Well, imagine after six hours on there and after that little bitty prick of that little bitty spear in his side just got up, rolled that stone away, walked right out. Of his own human power. I say again that the authorities knew where the grave was. Matthew 27, 62 through 66. Remember they, they sealed the tomb. They assigned the guards to the site. And they had the records. The best conclusion. The simplest conclusion. Is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was crucified on the cross. Died on the cross was taken down to the cross, buried, and three days later he rose from the dead to die no more. But you see, if you choose that view on the basis of the credible witness and adequate evidence, you realize what that means? You've got to change your belief in your life. It's the same thing why people go over and say, well, the Bible's not the Word of God. Because you get rid of the, of, of the creation, and then you have to get rid of God. And if you get rid of God, who are you accountable to? For your actions and beliefs. Nobody. And, of course, that's what humanism declares. What's the, who is the measure of all things according to the humanist? Man is. You're accountable to yourself. You had witnesses like Luke, 
he was a physician and a historian of high caliber. That's been proven. We can't go into detail on this altogether. Acts 1-3, Luke said he showed himself alive after many infallible proofs or after his passion. Proofs. Think of what proof means. That's the strongest possible thing you can offer to say such and such did happen or didn't. And then very quickly, those who saw Jesus alive. I'm just going to go down a list here. Those who saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. Mary Magdalene at the tomb after Peter and John left. John 20, 11 through 17. Mark 16, 9 through 11. He showed himself alive to a group of women who visited the grave. Matthew 28, 9 through 10. Peter on the afternoon of the resurrection, Luke 24, 13 through 35, and he's referred to again by Paul in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, that we read a while ago. The two disciples who were walking to the little town of Emmaus, Luke 24, 13 through 35, Mark 16, verse 12. The 11 disciples on the very evening of his resurrection, Mark 16, 14, Luke 24, 36 through 43, John 20, 19 through 23. To all twelve, one week after the resurrection, John 20, 26 through 29. To seven of the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, asking Peter three times if he loved him, John 21, 1 through 23. To 500 brethren, most alive, when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. In other words, it could be verified. That's why I say, who are most alive. To James, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. And remember, none of the brethren of according to the flesh, half brethren to our Lord, believed in, his believed in him as the Son of God until after his resurrection. That ought to say something. To eleven disciples on a mountain in Galilee where the Great Commission was given, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. To the apostles on the Mount of Olives just prior to his ascension, Luke 24, 44 through 53, and Acts 1, 3 through 9. To Stephen as he was being stoned, Acts 7, 55 through 56. To Paul, of course, then Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, 3 through 6. To Paul while praying in the temple, Acts 22, 17 through 21. To Paul while in prison in Caesarea, Acts 23, 11. To John while in prison in Patmos, Revelation 1, 12 through 20. Now why do you have those specific accounts of those people? Well, I don't believe any of them then you won't believe anything to do with anything in antiquity. Do you realize there's far more evidence what I've given you right here from books that, that they claim are books of antiquity? Well, are you going to say, tell me all these people lied? They just lied through their teeth. Well, again, what did they get for reward for, the, for that lie they would not give up? Reasonably intelligent people they're not fools given to hysteria. There's nothing to say they were dishonest. Not at all. Simon Greenleaf, royal professor of law at Harvard some years ago, in his work, An Examination of the Testimony of the Four Evangelists by Rules of Evidence Administered in Courts of Justice, said this, and I quote, well, it was, and then I quote, impossible that they, referring to the apostles, could have persisted in affirming the truths they have narrated had not Jesus actually risen from the dead and had they not known this fact as certainly as they knew any other fact. Page 424. Now think about that. If they're going to deny these things, why well, these facts have come down to us, the testimony that they've given then what are they going to do when they accept other facts that don't have nearly as many people cooperating in them? What are they going to do? They and, and in fact, <laughs> they have just destroyed our whole jurisprudence system as to how we prove anything in court. Now imagine, you've got a will, and you've had it gone over, and hopefully it's the best as you can get it. It's done. And you die, and everybody attacks it just like they've attacked. These fellas, these nitwits, have attached or have attacked the, uh, the evidence of the Lord. Remember, this is his last will and testament. So you can examine it as they teach you in law school how to deal with contracts and wills. And that's what this man did. On and on we could go, the character of these witnesses and things of that nature. The point is Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. If you don't believe and obey him, you're lost. And everything we studied that we mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, our singing to God, the sermon I preached, 
our study of the Bible, the Bible itself, our prayers, our efforts to help other people, uh, to understand the truth, to discuss it. What does it mean in my life? How do I do this? And so on. If the Bible addresses it, none of that amounts to anything. If Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not the Son of God, but if He rose from the dead, He is. That's why Jesus said, except you believe that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. And thus we preach Christ and Him crucified by the evidence given to us that cannot be successfully contradicted. So upon belief in Him, you'll comply with His will through such confidence in Him. And thus you'll believe Him when He says you must repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins to become a Christian. To not do that is not to become a Christian. It's not to show an obedient faith. As a child of God, if you have committed sin, that same Bible in His same will says you must repent of those sins, confess them, and God will hear the prayers that you offer and others offer on your behalf for the forgiveness of the sins you've repented of and confessed. That's God's second law part. So, when you leave here today, there's no reason that you can't say, Jesus Christ lives, for He was resurrected from the dead, and He's where the Bible says He is now at the right hand of God, ruling over His kingdom, and still offering the gospel, His power to save to all men who will believe and obey it, that they can have remission of sins and hope for eternal life. You're subject to the gospel call then. We invite you to come while we stand and sing.